I do want to talk about the Oasis plan. Now, this is to do with the um, West Asia, which would be Israel, Gaza. Uh, what other areas would be? Tell us what the Oasis plan is and which areas are targeted with this plan. <laughs> Well, right now, the situation obviously in Gaza is one of the worst uh, imaginable uh, moral crisis of humanity. It's not just what happens on the ground. You know, the fact that South Africa was the only country now fortunately joined by Ireland to have the moral courage to go to the International Court of Justice just barely saved our honor as a human species. So having said that, you know, the question is, how do you end this? You know, because if you if you do not inject some completely different perspective of hope, then you know, even if you kill the present uh, generation of uh, Hamas, then take a few years and the whole thing comes back more viciously right. and more horribly. So you have to think about changing the entire dynamic. And my late husband, already in 75, this was the same year of the International Development Bank, uh, he proposed the OASIS plan. Um, that was the idea that if you look at the region of Southwest Asia, um, it's desert. I once flew from Khartoum to Amman and I looked out of the window of the airplane and I said, where is an oasis? There was none. For three and a half hours, you fly over yellow, yellow, brown desert. Mm -hmm. So it is very clear that many of the regional conflicts come from an incredible shortage of water and, you know, who controls the river and, you know, all of these things. So <clears throat> what he proposed was to think about creating lots of fresh new water. Uh, and the most efficient way, I mean, there are many methods. You can access aquifers, you can have ionization of the atmosphere. All of these are auxiliary methods, but to have the quantity of fresh water, the most obvious is to create new canals, to build canals between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea and the Black Sea, and then use these canals for a system of desalination desalination of large quantities of ocean water, make them into fresh water, and then use that for large systems of irrigation. That way you can develop agriculture, you can develop forest, reforest trade. The Chinese, you know, they, they reforested a desert area in the northeast of China of a territory larger than that of Germany. Wow. It's in fa fantastic, you know, it's, that's not reported by the mainstream media, but that would be a way of fighting against climate change, you know, I mean, that's how you should do it. Uh, so then, you know, once you have this plenty of uh, fresh water, you can start to develop infrastructure, railways, highways, ports, you can build cities, you can, I mean, you must have the idea that the entire region of Southwest Asia could become as infrastructure dense as Germany. Now, Germany, when it still functioned, that's a little while ago, but there was a period where Germany was an ideal case of integrated infrastructure. You know, you had container ships uh, traveling on the Rhine, going to the inland port of Duisburg, then going to trains, going to the factories. A perfect system because infrastructure is very relevant to the productivity of the production process. The more highly developed your uh, industry is, the more you are relying on good infrastructure because of time and, and efficiency. So just imagine if you would take the entire region of Southwest Asia from, you know, uh, even India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Syria, uh, Iraq, Yemen, uh, Turkey, uh, Israel, Palestine, Egypt, if you take this and the Gulf states, if you take this entire region as one and you would approach it this way, you could rebuild countries which are incredibly poor, you know, and some of them are not. Uh, Food, food sufficient, and you would give a perspective of hope. 
you know, just the fact that you would have cranes and bulldozers starting to dig channels and, you know, you, people would see the activity. Young people would have hope. They would say, I become a teacher. I become a, uh, you know, engineer. I will study archaeology. I will study all kinds of things. And that way, you know, the idea that you have to resort to terrorism would vanish because there would be a general atmosphere of hope. And, you know, I think that that is an idea which which definitely catches on because, I mean, also the countries in the region who are not poor, like the Gulf states, um, uh, Jordan, um, you know, other countries which are relatively better off, they have an interest in the stability of the region and they should all come together and, you know, create a system of investment whereby, you know, this can be done. And I, I think it's the only way how to create peace, how to create a two-state solution, how to create peace between Israel and Palestine, but only in the context of a general development of everybody in the region that this can be solved. So we will have a big conference on the 13th of April, internet conference, if your viewers are interested, you should definitely join that conference and help us build because, you know, people say this will never happen. The Israelis will not do it. Well, but I'm convinced that people in Israel want to have a peaceful future as much as the Palestinians and all the neighbors. And I think that the only way how we can realize it is if we create a chorus of voices, you know, from the region, but even from all of the world who say that is the way to go, it can become a reality because, you know, the situation is so absolutely traumatic that a change must occur. And again, it's like with Ukraine, either you go in the direction of diplomacy and reconstruction, or it could become a regional war and beyond that a world war. So I think the choice is, is very clear and the reason very big to fight for the OASIS plan. Sounds like most of the policies or most of the vision that you that you have uh, revolves as we started the beginning of this conversation with the new just world economic order. And it revolves around economics quite a bit. It's about money and prosperity. And when people have prosperity, when they have hope for a better future because they see development happening where they are, then it solves a lot of the problems that we seem to be facing. It solves the migrant crisis, as you mentioned. People absolutely would prefer to stay with their families, in their culture, where their language, their food, what they're used to. People, you know, my family comes from Vietnam. They're refugees from Vietnam. They absolutely would have loved and would have preferred to stay in Vietnam if they could have. And, and they dreamt about going back when they came here to the United States. They always talked about moving back to Vietnam. People want to be with at home. They want to go home. And that, so that I think definitely economic development, especially in the global South, would solve quite a few, quite a bit of the, of the issues. And obviously, ending the warmongering, the immigrants that you have in Germany, the refugees you have there from Syria, largely from Syria, where there's a major war that was going on and uh, has been going on there. And so if we end these wars, if we help instead focus less on trying to control the world, but instead focus on trying to build the world, then we probably would end up with a better world in the end. That's what it sounds like is the vision. And it's a it's a wonderful vision. It's a it's a wonderful vision that, and it's it makes so much sense, it, common sense, in fact, that it's odd this hasn't been widely implemented or, or widely adopted by the West. It does seem that China has adopted a lot of these. Would you say China has adopted many of these ideas and visions, and that the West yeah. is very behind on that? Um, yes, I think, and I think it's funny, you know, because on the one side, naturally, uh, what the present Chinese uh, policies are is in conformity with the 2,500 years of Confucianism, which is built on harmony, on development of everybody, you know, that harmony can only be in the family if each member of the family develops 
harmony in the state can only be if all the parts of the state develop and actually international peace can only be if all develop. So it's not a completely new idea to the Chinese uh, philosophy. But I think, especially since Deng Xiaoping made the reform and opening up policy, um, you know, it's, it's really funny, but the Chinese are really doing what the young American Republic used to do with the American system of economy. That if you look at the state banks of uh, China, for example, they have, I think, four state banks and then a national bank. Uh, then now they have the new development bank of the BRICS. These are policies which are really in the tradition of Alexander Hamilton, you know, the first finance minister of uh, America after the American Revolution. And if people would study that and, and look at it, and also Friedrich List, you know, the German economist who was very close to the uh, American system of economy, he wrote many interesting books about that. Friedrich List is the most popular Western economist in China. So Hamilton and List are popular in China, but in the West, uh, you know, the West has turned away from these, let's say, dirigist leaning policies. Uh, for example, you know, the West has adopted a policy of liberalism, extreme liberalism, everything goes, everything is allowed, there's no standard anymore. The Chinese say, no, we have to improve the moral character of the population. Then naturally the mainstream media turns around and says, oh, that's the proof that they are dictators. But, you know, in periods when the Western countries functioned better, we had also the idea of a moral obligation of the state to improve the moral character of the people. For example, Alec, uh, Friedrich, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, who was the you know, education minister in Germany during the time of the Prussian reformers, he had the idea that you have to have an education system where the aim is a beautiful character. You know, nowadays, if who talks about a beautiful character? Nobody. But the Chinese have that. So a lot of things what, that once you, <coughs> you know, not look at it through an ideological spectacle, but actually look at what is the aim and what is the purpose and effect, you realize that much of what China is doing is what we used to do in the West, but we have moved away from. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, well, it's, it's, it, it's going to be an interesting next 30 years or so as we see how the world plays out, who wins the battles, I suppose. I think China is definitely on a path of making a lot of friends around the world. And that path is, you know, that is a much more beneficial and I think productive path than what the West has been on, which is making a lot of enemies around the world through bullying and sanctioning and starting wars and, and now going after countries saying, oh, climate change, so you're not allowed to develop. And uh, I, I think it's going to be a really interesting 30 years. I hope, though, that the policies, the visions, the programs that you have you and your institute and your colleagues have tried to implement, I hope that more people start to hear them. I hope more people, especially now, I think, as the world is, has come to where it's at and people are starting to look around and think, gee, you know, we're not in a good spot. I hope then people listen to these policies and they think, well, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> that thing, That makes a lot of sense and maybe we should start uh, electing leaders who have similar views and visions and hopes for for the world, for that better future, for that new just world economic order. Helga, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for this conversation. It's really insightful. And um, like I said, eye-opening, I think, for a lot of people to hear things that just make so much sense, and yet they're being so terribly ignored here in the West. But really appreciate the conversation, Helga. Well, thank you very much. It's like journalists like you who, you know, give the hope that journalism is not a dead profession. <laughs> not yet, anyway. Thank you, Helga. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>